Hi guys, welcome to episode 16 of Kling Spores Tech Talk. I'm Nick DeMars, and today we have a very special uh, guest with us, a good friend of mine for many years. Chris Smith is with us from Kling Spores Woodworking Shop. Uh, in the past, Chris has been a wide belt machine technician, so we're going to kind of pick his brain a little bit today. We're going to kind of draw on his experiences and his knowledge from the past and uh, see if he knows anything. Hopefully he does, because I'd like to learn something here today. Well, I'm getting a little older, so there's not a lot of brain left to pick, but we'll, I'll do my best. We'll do what we can here. Okay, so to start off with today, we've got a new video we want to present to you, talking about some of the wide belt basics, and let's go ahead and watch that thing now. Hi guys, Nick from Klingspore Abrasives. You know, the last couple of videos we've done, we uh, created a end grain cutting board. We made some shoe mold and some quarter round. Well, this time we're gonna do it a little different. We're gonna lean a little more toward the educational side. Maybe you can learn something new about wide belts. What are wide belts? Uh, what are they good for? What kind do I need to use? Things like that. So let's jump in. A wide belt in a cling spore world is any abrasive belt that is 12 inches or over in width. So you could possibly see wide belts anywhere from 12 inches wide to upwards of 60 inches. Some are even wider, but they are referred to as segmented belts because excess material is added to make them wider than the parent roll of abrasive material known as the jumbo roll. If the jumbo roll is 61 inches wide, then any belt wider than this is a segmented belt. Some abrasive belts are very long, but are not wide enough to be considered a wide belt. An example of this would be the six inch by a 186 inch belt for the edge sander. If you're considering purchasing some wide belts, it is very important that you know the correct size for your machine. If you don't know the correct size belt for your particular machine, but you do have an old used belt, check out our video, how to measure an abrasive belt correctly. You've heard us tell on numerous occasions that coated abrasives, or what's commonly called sandpaper, is made up of three parts, the grain, the backing, and the bond that ties everything together. When it comes to wide belts, the backing is a very important consideration. In wide belt applications, there are three backings that stand out, cloth, paper, and polyester. Cloth is the most used backing material. It can perform any operation from material removal to finishing, but is usually recommended for material removal in grits 24 to 60 and intermediate sanding in grits 80 to 120. Paper wide belt backings are made from very heavyweight paper. Paper backings are rated by weight, with F weight being the heaviest. And as you can imagine, F weight is the chosen material for wide belts as it is very thick and durable and can withstand the pressures of wide belt sanding. Paper belts I best use as finishing belts in grits 150 and up as the abrasive grains sit very flat on the surface of the paper. Polyester belts are the heaviest duty belts on the market today. Polyester is a polymer based material that is extremely strong and durable. An added benefit is that belts with a polyester or a polyester cloth blended backing are waterproof. This means that a belt of this nature can be washed when it gets extremely dirty, allowed to fully dry, and then put back into service. In order for a belt to be created, both ends of the material have to be joined. Belt joints come in several different configurations that are useful for various applications. For more information on belt joints, watch our video on Understanding Abrasive Belt Joints. For application purposes, grit ranges should be used as follows. Grits 24 through 60 are for material removal, planning, or dimensioning with a cloth or a polyester backing. Grits 80 to 120 are for intermediate sanding, usually with a cloth backing. And grits 150 and up are the finishing grits, best used with a paper backing and a number one joint. All right, guys, so that gives you a lot of good general information about wide belts, about how you can choose the wide belt that's best for your application. Thank you for joining us. Please like and subscribe to our channel.
So Chris, as you can see, we kind of focused on wide belt backings in this video. We mm -hmm. kind of wanted to present a general overall look at uh, wide belts, but uh, we get a lot of questions about machines uh, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of questions about uh, some, some specifics, some things that go wrong with the machines. We want to kind of cover some of that today, but to get us started, let's take a look at this picture, this diagram that you have created, mm -hmm. and tell us a little bit just generally about a wide belt machine, what it does, how it works, you know, the different parts involved. Well, looking at it from the outside, it looks like a giant cabinet. And, uh, but really what a wide belt machine is, it's a series of moving parts. And so what a lot of people don't realize, unless you own one or seen one up close, is those moving parts are all packed tightly into that giant cabinet. So the diagram just kind of shows you things that are, are more exploded out so you can get more of a general view of, of what that looks like. And so all, all wide belts essentially are the same. The only thing that may change are some of the components inside of there, different head configuration. It may have a, uh, a, a side stroke belt, or it may have a series of discs. You know, the, usually there's other components that can be added in, but essentially it's a wide belt machine. And you've got a series of rollers that are designed to hold down the machine, hold down your part to the conveyor belt. That conveyor belt then runs at a specific feed rate, and that usually can be adjusted some. And those rollers will keep the part held down as it hits each stage of the machine. So whether that's your, your, you've got a one head or a three head or a multi different headed machine, the principle is still the same. You're going to have two rollers on either side of that head holding the part down before or after it leaves that particular section. Each head would have a particular grit and you would typically going to go up in grit to clean the previous scratches made from that particular section. So a wide belt essentially is just a machine with a conveyor, just sanding flat parts. So you've got the conveyor pulling the part into the machine with a wide belt running the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. With that being the case, and to hear you talk about it, it kind of brings up the question to me, uh, I, I would assume that, this, that the feed rate that you mentioned is, mm -hmm. is a pretty important part of that whole process. It is. Some machines offer a lot of versatility. It could be the feed rate of the conveyor, uh, some even offer a variety of uh, speeds that which the, the actual sanding belt will, will pass. And so all of those can really create multiple scenarios when you're trying to diagnose what's going on. Uh, it's not as simple as your belts don't work um, because typically I've found that majority of the time if there's an issue, it's not related to the belts. And since I don't work for Klingspore, I can say that. But I'm working on enough machines the way I have, I can tell you that it is, uh, it's definitely most of the time due to either machine issues or due to operator error. One of those two usually leads to the culprit um, and occasionally a small percentage, I would say maybe 15 to 20% of the time, it is in fact related to the abrasives belt. So um, that, that's the, generally the way I look at it. I don't go straight away with when the customer would say this or that ask a lot of questions because the more questions you ask, the more truth you find out to what's really going on. Uh, one of the things that I've heard quite a bit from customers, from our, some of our sales reps, is about chatter marks. Mm -hmm. Chatter marks seem to be fairly common as far as wide belt machines are concerned. What have you seen with that and what have you seen most often to be the culprit? Well, and most of the people would say the, the biggest issue with chatter marks is the actual belt joint. And for the most part, that could be true. But with a machine that operates as frequently and as fast and takes as much abuse as a wide belt machine does, those parts aren't going to last forever. So yes, the belt joint, mainly the tape joint on the back, could be the culprit causing that thump every time it makes its way around, making contact with the workpiece. But it also could be a number of other things. You could have bad bearings in your roller which would allow that roller head to move up and down as your work passes through. Um, you could have a, a, a roller that's, that's not true anymore, where it's not truly round. Maybe it's got a flat spot on the, on the roller itself. So there's a number of other things that it could be within the machine uh, that could be causing the problem. And you could have debris behind the, the, the roller itself. You could have, um, a, if you're using a rubber drum, on your roller, it, it could have a parts of the rubber being uh, coming apart and being wedged in behind the belt as it's making contact. So there's a number of things that it could be, and there's a lot of sort of diagnostics that could be done to determine whether the uh, whether the chatter is coming from the belt or whether the chatter is coming from the machine itself. 
Now the chatter most likely uh, in most cases will be across the grain since mm -hmm. you're feeding your peat workpiece through with the grain. Uh, but we have seen some instances where we've seen uh, uh, marks with the grain, marks mm -hmm. down the length of the workpiece. Yep. What, what have you seen in the past that has to do with that? Well, that, that really could be caused by any number of things. But one of the first questions I would always ask is, is that line or that, that mark that's running with the grain, is it an actual raised line or is it a groove that's made mm -hmm. in the line? Because that will sort of dictate which direction my next questions might be or what the possible solutions um, might be the cause from that. Now, we understand, too, that some marks can be caused by static electricity. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a, a big culprit when it comes to these wide belt machines. And I understand there's several different things you can do to kind of alleviate the uh, static from building up in the system. Yeah. But uh, I'm sure you've experienced some of this, too, the static problems. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about those and some of the things that can be done to kind of alleviate those. Well, we've all scuffed our socks across the carpet and touched the door and been zapped. Static electricity is everywhere. And what we find uh, in the abrasive side of things is that it becomes much more prominent in the colder, drier months. Uh, you'll find that the static, sometimes you'll have belts and, and machines that run flawlessly for nine months out of the year. And then all of a sudden, for three months, they're, they're constantly having these bad finish results and they're having these lines uh, on, along the grain. And what, what we found is the static electricity is being built up into the machine. Hmm. Now, you get some of the drier climates like in Arizona or, or you know, places out west like that where there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot less humidity in the air. You find that they've experienced that more frequently, but typically the way they solve their dry uh, climate area is they bring in these swamp coolers, so that adds humidity. So they're, they're in, in introducing the humidity, and that kind of helps – alleviate some of the static that may occur. But typically, static lines are gonna happen inside the machine and the result is usually going to be a slight raised line. If you rub your finger across it, it looks like it's actually grooved, but if you slightly rub your finger across it, you can feel that it is a raised bump or line that's been made. Um, and one of the most common things you can do is ground your machine. Now, I, the more I talk to people about this, the comment I get back is, well, it's grounded at the dust collector and it's grounded at the plug. Yes, but if you've, if you've opened your cabinet door to, to a wide belt machine and you see really fine powder just stuck all over the cabinet, you likely have a, a static problem. And it may not always reveal itself, uh, but when it does, you're going to know it and it's going to be one of those things to, to, that's hard pressed to fix. However, simply driving a grounding rod into the ground six to eight feet and in running at least a 10 gauge uh, copper wire, 12 will work um, in, some, in most cases, but, but grounding it to the actual metal part of the bed, uh, to that grounding, grounding rod, you'll find that your static will completely disappear. And I've got countless stories of that occurring, where we've gone in, evaluated the wide belt machine just to find out, you know, they couldn't resolve it, couldn't resolve it. They did the grounding like we recommended, and sure enough, the, the problem completely went away. I understand too that we have, and, I, and I've seen some of these sold, that we have some uh, belts that have a special coating on them mm -hmm. that kind of helps with that static. What is that all about? Yeah, I mean, and CleanSport has got several products that work great for this application. And that is, um, you know, when you're, it's got an anti-static coating. And, and that also is usually in conjunction with other features and benefits of some of the belts that they make. But that's a special coating that actually helps repel the dust and in most cases, that will work great. But if you get a machine that's, that's very high in static electricity, it's got to discharge somewhere. And it's going to discharge through the heads of the machine, which generally is going to make, make contact with the wide belt and your workpiece. And that's going to create all kinds of problems. So even with a really good super anti-static belt, that won't fix all the problems if your machine is not properly grounded. I uh, was perusing the internet one day uh, for wide belt uh, issues and things to read about and I found a article that I read through and it turns out that you wrote the article and in this thing it mentions that uh, hanging tinsel over the belt. What does that do? It, it's uh, it, because it's got this light metal that can help dissipate some of the discharge that 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 static electricity needs to to find a way to do. And it's, and, it's and, great for having that Christmas Christmas atmosphere too, isn't it? It is. So it keeps you festive year round. That's right. That's right. 
Okay, so we're going to talk in, in a minute about uh, abrasive belt joints, but, but before we do, let's watch a video that we produced a while back about that very subject. At one point in belt production, both ends need to be connected. This is what we call a belt joint. Generally, we separate between two different belt joints, the butt joint and the overlap joint. For an overlap joint, the grit is taken off down to the backing on one end, while the other one is scuffed and both are glued together. When creating a butt joint, both ends are scuffed, glue is applied, and splicing tape is used to put both ends together. In today's video, we are showing you the most popular belt joints within these categories that you can find in Kling Spore's product range. One of the belt joints that you will find a lot is the number four joint, the butt splice in which both ends are butted together and joined by high strength tape allows running the belt in both directions for greater belt life and convenience. Belts with this joint are used for a large variety of applications. A similar belt joint is our number three joint. The only difference is that the ends are cut in a zigzag. This joint is ideal for the glass industry and available in grits 80 and finer. On very fine cloth belts, the T joint finds use. This is a top skived number four butt joint for platen sanding operations on wide belt sanders 150 grit and finer. The T-joint is also used for grits 80 and up when chatter is a problem. Let's take a look at the overlap joints next. For our number one belt joint, both ends are overlapped without removing grain. That offers maximum protection against wear in the lap joints. It's a standard joint for pump sleeves, but you can also find it on belts for soft contact wheels, slack of belt operations, or on wide paper belts in 150 grit and finer. Different than the number one joint is the number two, for which parts of the grain are removed from the ends of the belt before overlapping. This ensures smooth running over platens and hard contact wheels for cloth belts 80 grit or finer. This joint is mainly seen on edge sanders where bull nose or deadhead sanding is done. The last joint we want to introduce you to is the number six joint. The belt ends are overlapped with the complete grain removal off the top of the splice and cut in a 45 degree angle, minimizing the amount of time the joint is in contact with the workpiece. This special belt joint comes into place for applications that require a highly conformable joint area such as mold sanding. The belts Klingspore offers are always equipped with the most suitable belt joint for your application. Nevertheless, knowing the difference helps you to understand your abrasives and improves your sanding process. So there's a good bit of information there about belt joints and and you know before we go much further talking about this I do want everybody that's watching to know that if you order a belt uh, from Klingspore Abrasives our manufacturing team is fantastic they will automatically know by what kind of belt you order the grit stuff like that what kind of joint that it's going to require but uh, talk to us a little bit, bit, bit about belt joints Chris how important are they? Well, I mean, they're pretty crucial. I mean, the default belt for, for clean sport is going to be what's known as the number four, that butt joint uh, with tape on the back. Now, what clean sport does is they typically will, will bump that top grain just to reduce that a little bit uh, on most of the grits. And what that does is it eliminates that, that height thickness variance once the tape is added. And each, each uh, grit will use a different thickness of tape based on the material and other criteria. So it's not like we just randomly pull the specialized tape out. It's specifically for certain grits, certain applications, um, but the number four is gonna be the most common. And if you get in certain cases, when you get into that 120, 100 to 150 range, and you still want to use cloth, um, there's ways we can sort of remedy some of those issues. We can do what's called a top skive, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we remove the grain from the top of the belt. And so you've got the tape on the bottom. The grain on top has been scuffed off mostly, so it creates a very smooth transition when that tape joint comes back around. Uh, but when you get into the paper uh, belts, that's a different story. Once you get into that 120, especially 150 and above, 
Uh, the number one joint is a much smoother belt and it'll offer a much better finish, especially transitioning over to paper. But you don't really want to do that on cloth. There's only one type of uh, material that we do that on and that's pump sleeves. Hmm. Not a very structurally sound product for a cloth belt doing it, doing an overlap. Absolutely. So I want to remind everybody out there, if you have a question you'd like to send in, we're going to do another episode of this, uh, what is it, April 20th. Uh, so uh, we're going to kind of continue on with the wide belt theme and talk some more about it with Chris. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have any questions you want to send in, uh, you can send those to techtalk at clingspore.com. That's T-E-C-H-T-A-L-K at clingspore.com. And we will get to your questions. Uh, you know, we just covered the belt joints, and you talked a little bit about some of the grain. Uh, and that brings up the question about loading. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we see this sometimes in discs, belts, whatever the case may be. But uh, talk to me about loading as far as a wide belt is concerned. Is there some way we can reduce this? Well, there's a, there's a lot of ways that we can sort of remedy and reduce some loading. Uh, certain materials, it, they're just conducive to that. If you're dealing with a lot of soft woods, especially a resinous wood like pine, uh, just expect it. Just know that it's going to happen. There's really no way around it. Uh, certain hardwoods also that also might produce that, especially if they're an oily hardwood. If you're doing a lot of exotic woods, uh, you'll find that those oils will create an area, not so much loading like resins will, but the oils can generate issues with heat, which will present themselves like loading. Um, you can use a more, a more open coat abrasive. Uh, typically, the, the, you can find them in an open, closed, and semi-open uh, property. And you know, typically on resinous and oily woods, uh, we might lean you more towards an open product. Uh, looking at the anti-static, that also helps remedy some of that because as the waste material is being evacuated off the belt, um, that, that helps you helps that dust that's being circulated around to not want to come back and bond to that. Checking your dust collection. Uh, if you don't have proper CFMs pulling that waste material out, you know that's going to present a, a major loading issue because if it's not being pulled out, that means it's staying in the cavity or in that cabinet. It's got to go somewhere. It's almost always inevitably going to go back onto the wood surface and be buried on, and the next, uh, as the next belt passes over. You mentioned a term a minute ago, CFMs. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that, cubic feet per minute? It is. What it, does that refer to? It essentially is just talking about the, the amount of airflow being pulled. Um, most machines, if you check with the manufacturer, your machine will have a minimum recommendation for CFM. Now, what that, what that in, it really goes back to is the dust collection system that's used there. Most small shops, they, they may have a, a unit off to the side. You get into the big, big industrial shops, uh, they're going to have those big monster units that are sitting outside of their facility that are just, just you know, the size of, of buildings. Uh, but most smaller shops, again, it's just a, a dust collector. And if, if it's a really small shop, it can be anything from a two horsepower to a five. Uh, the CFMs, typically most, most wide belt machines require a, at least 1,100 CFM minimum at each port. So if you've got a three head machine, that's 1,100 CFM times three. You've got to have that at each port. So um, you can buy anemometers to, to measure that CFM rating. Um, obviously, you'd have to do some math along with that based on your, your size of your pipe and the different fittings that you'd have. Uh, but essentially, an anemometer will allow you to measure that so you know you're meeting that minimum requirement. I did see a good example of what you're talking about at one point. I went to visit a large cabinet shop, and they had multiple wide belt machines set up. Uh, but the thing I noticed that, number one, they were only one, running one machine, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was still having dust extraction problems. Mm -hmm. So got to looking around and found out that the valve that controls the ports that go to the other two machines, both those valves were open. Mm -hmm. So they were losing a lot of the dust extraction capabilities because those ports were open. We did notice an immediate uh, change in the extraction when those ports were closed. So yeah. it makes a big difference. It, it really does. I mean, I, I've been a woodworker a long time. Uh, I've got my own shop now and, and uh, my own cyclone system, a lot of, a lot of machinery.